Hi and welcome to this Leaving Cert Higher Level Complex Numbers Revision video. In this video we're going to focus on working with complex numbers in rectangular form which will also include an introduction to complex numbers. If you want to work with complex numbers in polar form I've linked the video in the description below. So before we talk about complex numbers let's look at actually where they come from. So if we go back to the algebra section of the course where we looked at the nature of the roots of a quadratic function, that will give us a bit of context. So in that section, we would have talked about three graphs. And I suppose, what can you say about the roots of each of these quadratics? Now, I know in each picture there is two. There's a positive and then a negative version, but both represent the same thing in terms of roots. So if we think about quadratics, x squared, so remember a quadratic is where we have the variable to the power of 2, so usually an x, so x squared, and because of that squared, that degree 2, they'll always have two roots, but the different scenarios show us that this happens in a few different ways. In graph A here, we see that there are two distinct real roots. So the word distinct means different. So we can clearly see on both of those graphs, the positive and the negative, there are two red dots to represent the roots that are in two different places. In graph B, okay, so here we only have one dot. Now we know that quadratics always have two roots. However, these two roots are the same. We say that there is only one distinct real root, not that there's only one root. There are still two roots. They just both happen to be the same. So there's only what we will consider one distinct or different root. We then have this, these graphs here, graph C, which show us that there are no roots. But in algebra, we would have been very specific about our language here. And we would have said, actually, there are no real roots. So I suppose that idea of real, we don't go into it deeply when we're in algebra, but I suppose it becomes very important now as we move into the complex number section. So where did this all come from? Well, if we look at the minus b formula and three scenarios that really were worked with the three graphs and you worked them through, um, and you can do that yourself if you want to pause the video and work through as an exercise. But what you're going to find is there's one part of the minus b formula that really dictates where, what the nature of the roots will be. So the piece that we care about is called the discriminant, and it's this part here, b squared minus 4ac. So that's the piece that if it is a positive number, we end up with adding and subtracting something. So we end up with two distinct or different roots. If that is zero, we add and subtract nothing, which means we end up with just one root. And if that is less than zero, so a negative number, we get an error, whereas we don't get any real roots. So we can look at this piece, this discriminant, and I suppose go deeper with scenario three. So scenario one and scenario two, that's fine. We've worked with that quite a bit. But scenario three, we could only identify in algebra, and that was it. So this section is really about going deeper into that third scenario where there are no real roots. So go back to these pictures and let's look at this in terms of our discriminant. So two distinct real roots. We have b squared minus 4ac, that discriminant piece greater than zero, so where it's a positive number. In graph b, we have where there is one distinct real root, and that is where the discriminant is equal to zero. And together we can combine this by saying if there are real roots. So in that case, I don't know, is there one real root or two? two real roots. But if there are real roots, we combine that to be the discriminant is greater than or equal to zero. That's all what we've worked with in algebra. We can bring this in anywhere. We can show that the roots are a certain way. We can use the fact that the roots are a certain way. We can bring in a little bit of inequalities. This is very much the algebra space. But scenario three, this graph C, we have no real root. So where this b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, it's negative. So we're really talking about where there is a negative under the square root. 
So let's look deeper at that scenario three equation. So um, I've given you x squared minus 6x plus 13 equals zero. Uh, let's work with the minus b formula here. So ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. We have our minus b formula from our log tables. We sub in using your brackets. Be very careful with the sign. So a is one b is minus 6, c is 13. We work it through and all is fine to this point here. We get x is equal to 6 plus or minus square root of minus 16 over 2. And this this minus 16 under the square root, that causes a problem. If you go to your log or if you go to your calculator and try to put that in, you're going to get error. And um, when we get an error, oftentimes we go, oh, we've done something wrong. And yes, that's usually true if we are looking for a particular answer. So here I have square root of minus 16 in the algebra space. We stop here and we say equals error. There are no real roots. End of story. But what if we went further with this? What if we went deeper into it? What if we wanted to understand, can I work with this square root of negative 16? So let's forget about that error for a minute. Let's just put that, okay, yes, I know the calculator gives me an error, but maybe there's something that I can do with my knowledge of thirds and my knowledge of algebra that may be able to allow me to work with it. So what I'm going to do, using the laws of thirds, I'm going to split out that minus 16 into 16 and minus 1. And the reason I split it like that is because I can get the square root of 16. So I can split that up again. So once I break it into the factors, I can get the square root of each of the factors. They are, that is one of my laws of thirds. Remember, we're kind of working in um, the laws of indices space because square root is a power of a half. We do look at the laws separately, but that is where they're based. So now I can actually break that down into six plus or minus four square root of minus one all over two. So now let's look at it and say, well, actually, can I simplify that further? And you can. You could take out something in common on that top line. Highest common factor is two. Uh, we're dividing both terms by two. So basically, this boils down to three plus or minus two square root of minus one. Now, I suppose, why do we do that if we could have way back um, a few steps ago just said, well, it's an error. There's no answer. Well, at some point. Somebody suggested, well, even though the square root of minus one doesn't exist, if I square it, it becomes minus one. So it, it exists again. And that is where this whole section was born from. This idea of, well, if we just say error and we never do anything else with it, are we losing a sense of what happens when we end up squaring it and it exists again? So it's quite a complex idea, the fact that we have something that doesn't exist, but then when we do something to it, it exists again. So what we really want is really to keep that square root of minus one there as a placeholder so we can keep it and work with it. So when we do eventually square it and get a real number back, minus one, that we have it, that we haven't disregarded it. And I suppose square root minus one is quite awkward to write and to work with. So we suggested, let's simplify. Let's use a letter to stand for that. And the letter that was suggested was I for imaginary, because this is not a real number. There is no number that exists that gives us the square root of minus one. So let's call that I. And the interesting idea or property about I is when we square it, although I itself is not a real number, it doesn't technically exist, I squared does. It is minus one. That is a real number. But what it does is allow us to write our answer in a slightly nicer form, to have it in terms of I rather than the square root of minus one. I think this is a really important place to start because it really gives us the two main influences for this part of complex numbers. When we work with complex numbers, we are really working like an algebra expression or equation, depending on what we're working with. OK, so there's very much an algebra base here. And a lot of what we do will be rooted in what we would do in algebra.
The second element is really about the fact that it was a square root, that it was a third. So there's a lot of what you have already learned with regards to thirds that will come up in this section. So I would always suggest that as you're revising this, maybe just go back and revise thirds. So you're very, very clear on working with thirds and how we worked with thirds and I suppose the logic there, because if you're happy with that, then what we do for eyes will make more sense. To help, I've linked a third video in the description below if you want to work on that first. So let's break that answer down a little bit. So when we have anything that has an I attached, that is known as an imaginary number. So for example, the minus five I root three I, anything that is an I, it's called an imaginary number. So that I standing for the square root of minus one that doesn't technically exist, that is not real, that is given the name imaginary. The opposite of real is imaginary. So where complex numbers come in is when we combine real parts to our imaginary parts. So something like this. And that's what the answer of the previous example looked like. We have a real part. So here we have a two and then an imaginary part minus three i and a number that has both a real and an imaginary part is known as a complex number. So if you're wondering why these two different words are used and sometimes used interchangeably, but in the strict use of them, complex number is where we have a combination of a real and imaginary part and an imaginary is where we have that i that represents the square root of minus one. When we work with complex numbers, we usually use the symbol Z. So X, we tend to use in algebra. Z tends to be in complex numbers. It doesn't always have to be, but it's definitely the one we see most often. It will also help us to identify when we're working with an equation that we're in the complex space. When we see these questions appear on the paper, it's usually very clear that they're a complex number question because they start by defining I squared as equal to minus one. When we see these questions asked, they tend to be on paper one section A and they tend to be a question on their own. Some of the mock exams have tried to tie these into be section B questions, but I suppose they don't naturally lend themselves to doing that. So they do tend to be a standalone question. That's not to say that they couldn't be included in another question, but just to historically, that's how they have appeared. So let's look at example one, where we're being asked to write the square root of a negative number as an imaginary number. So we have square root of minus four. Now, if we do this one out the long way, how we want to proceed is basically split out um, whatever number is under the square root into its factors, and specifically with one of the factors being minus one. That would allow us to get the square root of four and then the square root of minus one. Square root of four is fine, that's two, we can simplify that. And then the square root of minus one changes to an i. You'll basically notice that the square root of the negative number is the same as the positive square root, but then it includes an i to account for the fact that it's negative. So for example, here, that is six i. Now, if we have something like square root of minus 27, you can go to your calculator and put in square root of 27, and then we're going to have an i. Now, when you're doing your square roots, it's good to kind of close them down so nothing gets pulled underneath there that shouldn't be there. When we work that out on the calculator, just the root 27 part, we get three root three and then an I. Now you can write it like that or you can write the I in front. I like to keep my I at the end, but it can be placed in either in front when we have something more complicated like this three root three. Square root of 20, let's do the same thing. So we end up with the square root of 20 and then an I at the end. So it's gonna be two root five, and then I. So you're gonna get quicker at that. You're gonna find it easier to work with those. And we don't do a huge amount of it, but it could come into a question. So let's look at solving an equation. Now, here we have quadratic. It's not a quadratic trinomial. Um, it's not even a difference of two squares. It's really adding two squares. It's not highest common factor. So I suppose how a lot of students would approach this is by bringing 
the 25 over. Now, I personally don't particularly like this method and would recommend difference of two squares. But since this technically isn't a difference of two squares, let's work with this method. So then when I put the square root on, it's really important to remember that we have a plus and minus there. When we put the square root into the equation, we must take into account that there is both a positive and a negative answer. Remember, we have a quadratic, which means there are two roots, so we should get two answers. Now we have the square root of a minus number. That means it's going to have an element of i, so it's, the answer is going to be plus or minus 5i. So I just said I'm not a big fan of this method. So then what other method is there? Well, really what you can do is make this a difference of two squares. OK, now I've made it a difference of two squares, but not true squares because the second square is minus 25. So if we were to work in brackets, one bracket has a minus, one bracket has a plus and I square root the second number. So I'm square rooting this. Now the square root of minus 25 is an imaginary number. It is 5i. So these are what my brackets look like. And I end up with x equals 5i and x equals minus 5i. And you can see your two answers there. Now I do think the first method is a little bit easier, but I would always stress that you need to remember when you put in a a square root, you need to take account of the two answers. The square root itself, that means the positive square root. OK, that's what it means. So in order to take account of the two answers, we need to put that plus and minus in front. So example three, let's look at a more complex quadratic equation and we're going to work with the minus b formula. So ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. You could try and say, well, I'm going to try factorization and it won't work. Um, or because we're in this section, you can say, look, we're just going to work with our minus b straight away. So we have our minus b formula here x equals minus b is 2 plus or minus square root b squared so that's 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2 all over 2 times a which is 1. Tidying that up we get minus 2 plus or minus square root of you can simplify this 2 squared is 4 take away 8 so that's minus 4 over 2. Um, you can work this the same way we did when I looked at the scenario 3 equation earlier in the video, but actually a more efficient way to do it is to change it to i as early as possible. So the square root of minus 4 changes to 2i all over 2. Now, another way, instead of highest common factor, that you can work with this, and that can be quite useful when we get into um, questions that don't give us nice answers. And when I mean by nice answers, I mean whole number answers. So what we can do is to actually split this fraction. So this fraction can be split as minus 2 over 2 plus or minus 2i over 2. This is the backward step of combining when we're adding fractions. So think once we have the common denominator, we add them and that denominator only stays once. So this is the backward step of it and it can be really, really helpful when we're working with complex numbers. So we end up with minus one plus or minus. Now you can write one i or just like in algebra, you can leave that as simply an i. We always tend to write the real part and then the imaginary part. Um, that is, and I suppose we'll understand that a bit better as we work with the graphing and how to show this. Um, but just like in algebra, yeah, you can have that one as a coefficient of i or you don't need to put it in, it's up to you. Okay, so there's my minus one plus or minus at uh, minus, sorry, plus or minus one i. So let's look at an argand diagram. So this is what this is what we plot a complex number on. So complex numbers have a real part and an imaginary part. If we go back to our definition of real numbers, real numbers are all the numbers on the number line. So that means by the definition of real numbers, and given that imaginary are not real numbers, imaginary numbers cannot be drawn on the number line. 
And it's true, they can't be drawn on the number line, but we can draw them on a separate one. So what we end up with is something very similar to our Cartesian plane, so our X and Y axis. Um, and the difference is we're going to have in this part, the real part of the complex number Z. And in here, this, what would usually be our Y axis, it's the imaginary part of our complex number Z. So we have two Z's, Z1 and Z2, and they want us to plot them on an argon diagram. So our argon diagram, you can split that up any way you want. I like to keep it um, evenly spaced on both axes. And uh, so there's one, two, three, four. So I'm using two boxes for each value. Although this is the imaginary axis, there is no need to write I. They represent I, but the fact we've defined that at the top there, that's absolutely perfect. So it just saves us writing I on all of these. We simply use what looks like a normal or a Cartesian plane. So minus one, minus two, minus three and minus four. So to plot them, we do plot them very like points. So Z1 is two on the real axis and minus one I or just minus I on the imaginary axis. So it would appear here. Okay, so two dun, 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 and minus one I or just minus I and we label that Z1. Now, what I find extremely helpful, um, and I'm going to struggle to do it here, is actually connecting the complex numbers back to the origin. So zero plus zero I. And I suppose why I find that that is helpful and doing that from an early kind of from the start of plotting is because it can very easily start to fall into this idea of we have points and we don't really we have a, a point that represents a complex number, but we work with them very differently than we would an X and Y point. So bringing it back to the origin will hopefully make a bit more sense as we work through it, but it might really help to understand that that is always our comparison. We go back to the origin. Let's plot the second complex number, Z2. That's one on the real axis and three on the imaginary axis. So that's here. Um, so one from the real axis, three on the imaginary axis, and that said two. And again, it might be helpful if you had a nice ruler to connect that there. Um, now with the ruler. <laughs> and as we start looking at different complex numbers, we're going to really try and understand geometrically the relationship between them. So understand how do they work with each other? How do they look? So before we get into all of that, let's look at simply working with these complex numbers. So here I have um, a, two complex numbers and I'm adding them. I'm being asked to evaluate it because my answer is a number. You can work these two different ways. So you can treat this like algebra. So just drop your brackets uh, plus again. So it's plus three plus four I add like terms. So your two plus your three five I plus four I that gives me five plus nine I. So that's probably the easiest way to work. Uh, you can kind of work it in more like old fashioned arithmetic kind of way. So one over the other. I suppose this kind of works better if you're adding and it doesn't work as well with subtraction. And um, where you used to algebra, we will probably be more inclined to work um, this the first way, I would think. But there is that option there. Uh, some people go straight into kind of just writing down the answer. That's fine. You'll get there and um, just be very, very careful with negatives. So let's look at a negative. So here I'm going to work in more of an algebraic way again. So three plus six. I Now, minus this whole bracket really is minus one. And I'm multiplying. Don't forget that. Now, my, you might be laughing. You're like, oh, we don't need to do that. But I suppose it's just to make it really clear that that minus has to affect that full complex number. So we're subtracting both of them. So again, let's look at our common or like terms. 
uh, so I have 3 take away 2, that's 1, and 6i minus 4i, which is plus 2i. So if you want to work these in, I suppose, a more old-fashioned arithmetic kind of way, so think back to how you would learn to add and subtract um, big numbers. So if we subtract it, we are going to change the signs of both pieces, both the real and the imaginary, and that gives me 2i, it's a positive 2i, and a 1. So same answer. I think that way, the second way is just a little bit more complicated, but some people do like to do it that way. So let's look at more of how this will be asked, because I suppose it's great to practice how to add and subtract complex numbers, but how will this look if it comes up in a question? So we have Z1, Z2 and Z3. Now I tend to need to box these in questions so I can see them properly. You can use highlighter, whatever you want, but I just find with the letters Z and I being slightly unfamiliar, it can easily kind of all into the sentence. Um, so just be careful, do what you need to do to see them in full. So they've asked us three different parts. The first one is Z1 plus Z3. So effectively what I see this as is substitution. So this is back to the substitution that you probably learned in algebra in first year. And I suppose I would always say use your brackets for substitution and then we're going to do the same thing here. So Z1 is 2 plus 3i and then we're going to add Z3 which is 1 plus 5i and you can do these very quickly so add your real parts you get 3, add your imaginary parts you get plus 8i. Very very straightforward. You can show your work if you want. 2 then now, this has the dot product on it. Sometimes we see that. Sometimes in mocks, uh, usually in the paper, we don't see it. Basically, what that means is Z2 multiplied by Z3. So it's more likely they'll just be written side by side. Again, use your brackets for substitution to help you. 3 minus 4i, bracket Z3, 1 plus 5i. Simply using your brackets, even if you didn't really get that that was multiplication, you should at this point be able to see that that's multiplication. Now, when we're multiplying out the brackets, we're going to use like, or we're going to do this like you would do any algebra brackets. Um, I'm going to split the bracket. If you use FOIL, that's fine as well. So whatever way you work in algebra, do the same thing here. The less methods you have, the better. The more likely you'll have a good method. So multiplying that out, I get 3 plus 15i minus 4i at minus 20 i squared. Now here's the one key difference with um, complex numbers, something that's not like algebra. I'm going to combine, let me get my highlighter, so I'm going to add my i's, so simplifying it, and I get 3 plus 11i minus 20i squared. So what's a little bit different is the fact that i is defined as the square root of minus 1. Okay, In algebra, usually the x has a range of values. It's a variable. The i here is more of a constant. It stays as one particular number. What that means is i squared is minus 1. And this is the definition that they tend to give us at the, at the start of all of our exam questions. We get i squared is minus 1. What that means is, although the i that we were using to stand for a number that didn't exist, um, when we square that and it becomes i squared, it does start to exist. So what we end up with is 3 plus 11i minus 20. And instead of i squared, we substitute in a minus 1. So that means we get minus 20 times minus 1, we get a plus 20. And now we're back to simply having a real part, which simplifies to 23, and an imaginary part. So unlike algebra, we don't have any powers higher than power 1. So we'll never see an i with a power, because we don't write our power 1. Squared, cubed, and so on. We're going to do a little bit more exploring on that, but that's a really important idea to remember. So let's look at the third part of this question. So we want Z1, so I'm going to use my bracket, 2 plus 3i, uh, times Z2. Now, you should be using brackets, but if there's brackets in the brackets, it's going to get a bit confusing. Um, so I'm just going to add them like this. So we have Z1 times Z2 plus Z3. So we have to do that adding first. So let's simplify the second bracket. 
and we end up with 4 plus i and then we split our bracket and we work with it. Now I'm going to work up here. So I get 2 times 4 plus i plus 3i 4 plus i. That is 8 plus 2i plus 12i plus 3i squared. I'm going to do my cleanup and my substitution at the same time. So I'm going to add my 2i and my 12i to get 14i. And then I'm going to put in, instead of i squared, minus 1. So I'm going to do that substitution. And that gives me minus 3. So I get 5 plus 14i as my final answer. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. So we have 3 plus 2i times 2 plus 3i. So I'm going to split my brackets 2 plus 3i and then I get plus 2i times 2 plus 3i. 3 by 2 is 6. 3 by 3i is 9i plus 4i plus 6i squared. You might start recognising that simply it changes the sign. So I get 13i minus 6. Okay, that's not what's happening. What's actually happening is i squared substituting in minus 1. But I suppose these are, this is how we'll end up as we're working, as you're moving quicker, maybe not necessarily showing it, it simply ends up with a change of sign. Now, this is an interesting question because it will be very, very easy to just write 13i. But the question asked us to write the answer in the form a plus bi. So it's important that we include both the real and the imaginary part. So 0 plus 13i. Always do what the question asks. It's a silly few marks to lose if you don't follow their instruction. Let's explore powers of i. Let's take i to the power of 1. That is simply i. We've also looked at i squared. Now, remember that i is actually a simpler way to write the square root of minus 1. When I square a square root, they effectively undo each other, which means I get i squared is equal to minus 1. If I then want to expand and move up to i to the power of 3, I can use the fact that i to the power of 3 is i squared times i. So breaking it down into pieces I've already worked with, that gives me minus 1 times i, which simplifies as minus i. i to the power of 4, that gives me, um, I can break it into i squared by i squared or i cubed by i, whatever way you want to work it. Uh, this is minus 1 by minus 1, so it gives me 1. If I went again and said, right, well, what about i to the power of 5? So this is going to be i to the power of 4 times i. I worked out i to the power of 4 was 1 times i, so that's i. i to the power of 6. That's going to be i to the power of 5 times i, which is i times i, which is i squared, which is uh, minus 1. <laughs> and on we go. And this will turn into a repeating pattern that repeats every 4. So you can see how i to the power of 5 is the same as i to the power of 1. i to the power of 6 is i to the power of 2. Let's look at how we can use that fact. Example nine, let's explore some powers of i. So i is quite interesting. If I take i and then square it, I get minus one. If I cube it, I can work out that actually I end up with minus i, and then i to the power of four ends up being one. And what happens is that pattern repeats. So effectively, when we talk about powers of i, we end up with a repeating pattern that repeats every four. This allows us to simplify any i to a power very, very simply. So how we work with any repeating pattern is we look at the remainder when we divide by however many it repeats after. In this case, it is a repeating pattern of four, which means we're going to divide by four and the remainder will tell us where to look. So really where we're talking about here is this is remainder one. Here is remainder two. 
here is remainder three. Now be careful, the next one is not remainder four, it's no remainder because remember we're dividing by four. So look at that power. If you divide that power by four, your remainder will give you which column it sits in. So let's take i to the power of 30. Let's take 30 first. So I take 30, I divide by 4. I'm not too interested in the fact I get 7. I'm more interested in the fact I'm remainder 2. So i to the power of 30 will be the same as i to the power of 2, which means looking at my little table above, that's minus 1. 11, again, dividing by 4, not terribly interested in how many times it goes in. I'm more interested in the remainder. So that means i to the power of 11 is the same as i to the power of 3, which is minus i. 19 then, I have 19 divided by 4, um, which gives us, again, not terribly interested in the 4, but it's the remainder 3. So i to the power of 19 is the same as i to the power of 3, which is minus i. 21, sorry now, 21 divided by 4, that gives me 5, not terribly worried, but remainder 1. So that's i to the power of 21 is the same as i to the power of 1 which is i. Now, i to the power of minus 4. If we first of all think about that in terms of our laws of indices, this works out as i to 1 over i to the power of 4. i to the power of 4 is 1, which gives us a final answer of 1. Example 10. Let's look at what happens when we multiply by i. This is strongly linked to the idea of what happens when we square, cube, or have i to any power. So make sure you're happy with that before moving here. This example is going to show us um, how exactly it will look in a diagram when we work with i to a power. So first part of the question asks us to plot z, which is 2 plus 3i. So it works out here, and just like always, I'm bringing it back to the origin. That origin is 0 plus 0i. Then it asks me to find and plot. So i times z, so i times 2 plus 3i, that gives me 2i plus 3i squared. i squared is actually minus 1, so I get minus 3 plus 2i. So I'm going to plot that and it works out here. So i z. Then it asks me i squared z. Now I'm going to take i and multiply it by what we've just worked out because that's what I'm doing. I'm taking i z and multiplying it by i again. I get minus 3i plus 2i squared. Changing that i squared to minus 1, I get minus 2 minus 3i. Plotting that, it ends up here. So this is i squared z. And then finally, i cubed z. I'm going to take my previous answer and I'm going to multiply that by i. So minus 2 minus 3i, which works out as minus 2i minus 3i squared. And then changing our i squared to minus 1, I get 3 minus 2i, which I plot and it works out here. And that is i cubed z. So it then asks us to comment on the relationship between them. Now, this is a very interesting relationship and it links back to the idea that i to the power of 4 gives us 1 and then we're back to where we started. So this idea of a repeating pattern every 4. What actually happens geometrically when we multiply a complex number by i is that it rotates 90 degrees anti-clockwise and you can see that constantly happening and what we actually end up with is we have complex numbers that are the same distance from the origin and I'm going to show that is with a circle so look at those blue lines they all represent um, a different radius but they're all the same length and that means that these four complex numbers z i z i squared z and i cubed z these are all equally spaced around the circle that's because what happens when you multiply by i let's write it down multiplying by i and i think it's so important to understand what happens on the diagram and this can really help even as you move into polar form in the roots so multiply multiplying by i by i 
rotates Z anti-clockwise 90 degrees. And that's not just for this, that will always happen. So it's a 90 degrees anti-clockwise rotation. But the length of that blue line remains the same. And that is what a rotation is. Okay, that's part of the rotation. And we're going to understand a little bit more about what that actually represents, that blue line, um, in another example. Example 11, complex conjugate. So the conjugate is where we change the sign of the imaginary part. I would use this language when we work, when we work with thirds because we have something very similar and for a very similar purpose. So the conjugate is written as Z bar. So we have been given Z which is three minus four i, and we want to find z plus z bar and z times z bar. Now, first of all, I need to understand well, what is z bar. So z bar is three plus four i, and that is called the conjugate. Okay, and that's always going to be the same. I want to show you how this looks on the diagram. So let's plot that. So z is 3 minus 4i, which is here. So there's my z. And my conjugate is 3 plus 4i. So there's z bar. And just like always, I'd suggest connecting these back to the origin. And actually, what we can see is Z bar is actually a reflection of Z through the X or through the real axis. Let's write that down. So Z bar is the reflection of Z under axial symmetry. So that's symmetry through a line. So axis, another word for line. So axial symmetry symmetry through the real axis. That is our x-axis. Okay, so our x-axis. That's what we're basically used to. Okay, so you can see that. Now, they've asked us to do two calculations. They've asked us, what, what do we get when we add our complex number with its conjugate? So let's see, so we get three minus four i plus three plus four i, and that actually gives us six. And that's not a coincidence. When we add our complex number with its conjugate, we always expect to get a real answer. And look at why that's the case. We're changing the sign of the imaginary part. So we're encouraging that imaginary parts to go to zero. They will cancel each other out. Let's see what happens when we multiply z by z bar. So z is 3 minus 4i, z bar is 3 plus 4i. Notice how these brackets, we effectively have the difference of two squares. We can use that fact, but for now let's multiply it out in full. I'm going to split my bracket first, 3 times 3 plus 4i minus 4i, 3 plus 4i. And that gives me 9 plus 12i minus 12i minus 16i squared. This um, plus 12i minus 12i gives me 0. Then minus 16i squared becomes plus 16. So I get 9 plus 16, which gives me 25. So if you wanted to do that maybe a quicker way, and you'll see why we need kind of a shortcut here, because these are going to be in a sum not just being asked like this, um, well, not at higher level anyway. So here we can use the idea difference of two squares. Square the first, that's nine minus, and then square the last, 16i squared, which gives me nine plus 16, which gives that final answer of 25. So that's just a quicker way to work when we're multiplying our z and our z bar together. I know in the question it has that dot product. That just means multiply. Don't worry about it. The second one is actually a full stop. We're more likely to see it written as just z, z bar, side by side. So let's look at a complex fraction. So I did say, and I will keep reiterating the fact that i represents the square root of minus one. So it is working like a third. So just like in thirds where we're rationalizing the denominator, we want to do something very similar here. We want to basically make it real. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get rid of my i. So I know that when I have an i squared, I will have um, a real number. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply above and below the line by i. Now, that hasn't changed my fraction because I'm multiplying effectively by 1. But what I will get is an i squared on the denominator that I can then change the i squared to a minus 1, which will be a real number. So I get 2i plus 5i squared all over 2i squared, which when I clean up becomes minus 5 plus 2i all over minus 2. Now, it doesn't exactly look like how we want because we want it to look like this. So I'm going to split my fraction so that there are two two individual pieces. And um, I, this is the backward step to combining our fractions when we're adding and subtracting. So we get minus 5 over minus 2 plus 2i over minus 2. Now that looks a bit messy, so I'm going to clean that up as 5 over 2 and then 2 divided by minus 2, that's actually minus 1, or we can just simply leave that as minus i. You could write in decimal, but I would prefer fractions. So do make sure you're clear on how you can go from a fraction where there's a real number in the denominator to our a plus bi form. What happens, though, if that denominator is a little bit more complex? i.e. a complex number as opposed to just an imaginary number like we had in the previous example. So here in example 13 we have um, a fraction that is a complex number at the top and a complex number at the bottom. Well what we need to do is we need to get rid of the i. I want it to just be a real number at the bottom. If I square the bottom I won't be getting rid of my i. What I'll end up with is a real part an imaginary part and then an i squared but I'll still have that imaginary part in the middle. So the method for doing this is actually using the conjugate. Now this is the purpose of the conjugate. It is to help us simplify fractions that have a complex denominator. So we always multiply above and below the line by the conjugate of the denominator, always the denominator. So what we end up with here is 3 plus 4i times 2 plus 5i, all over 2 minus 5i times 2 plus 5i. Now, I haven't changed the fraction because effectively that fraction will equal 1 because the top and bottom are the same, the numerator and denominator. Um, you can work this separately. So we can do 3 plus 4i times 2 plus 5i. So 3 times 2 plus 5i. You can work this in the fraction either. It really depends for me if I have space. I like to do it out separately um, and then come back to my fraction. If I don't, I'll keep it going. So now I have a 6 minus 20, so minus 14, and I have plus 23i. And my bottom line, I can use that difference of two squares shortcut. So now we can understand maybe why we would like it. So you square the first difference, so subtract and then square the last. So when we work that through, that's 4 plus 25, which is 29. So this turns into minus 14 plus 23i all over 29, which we can make into not so nice fractions, but we can make that into two individual fractions plus 23 over 29. The i can sit at the top or it can sit at the side, it doesn't matter. So if you want to write 23i over 29, that's perfect. I would tend to write the i out, out just to the side because then the fraction becomes the b and very obviously that b, that coefficient of the i. Example 14, transformations of complex numbers. So we've covered a lot of this already, but let's go back over this. 
write down a coordinate of z. So z is 3 plus 4i. So the question really wants us to look at some other complex number and comment on the relationship between them. So let's look at z1. So z1 is 1 fifth of z, which means it's 1 fifth of 3 plus 4i. So that gives me 3 over 5 plus 4 over 5 i, or if it's easier to plot, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.8 i. So if we were to actually look at that, so there's my line between z and the origin just to make it easier to work with, the point would be there. Now that's very interesting because that point z1 actually lies on the same line um, to the origin as z. And if we had this in front of us and we could measure, we'd find that the length from the origin to Z1 is actually a fifth of the length between the origin and Z. And we're going to look at that length um, in a bit more detail. But for now, it's important to understand that when we multiply by a number, that number will impact where it sits along the same line. So it's in the same direction, but the line itself is shorter. So what about Z2? So Z2 is I times Z, which is I times 3 plus 4I, which is 3I plus 4I squared, which ends up as minus 4 plus 3I. Plotting it, it ends up here. There it is, Z2. And as we discussed before, this is a rotation anti-clockwise 90 degrees of Z. The final one then is Z3 is the conjugate of Z2, which makes it minus 4 minus 3i. And when we plot that, it ends up down here. So there is my Z3. Um, and if we put in our line, we can see that that is the re um, reflection of Z2 under axial symmetry in the real axis. So it wasn't labelled here for us, but there is my real axis and here is my imaginary axis. So let's solve some equations involving complex numbers. So these equations are very much like um, solving an equation with thirds in them. Remember that I represents a third. So what we have is a bracket. So let's expand that first. So I get x plus 2i and then I expand that bracket, multiply by 2, so I get plus 6 minus 10yi equals 8 minus 13i. Now, we have an x and a y, so how do we solve two equations, sorry, how do we solve one equation with two unknowns? And the answer is because we have an identity. So this idea of the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, um, and we can allow, and we can break this up into two pieces. So remember your identities. Remember when we were working with, you know, the x squared terms, the x terms, and so on. Now we need to look at it slightly differently. You would have met this in thirds by looking at the rational and irrational pieces. Now what we want to break it into, we want to break it into the real pieces and the imaginary pieces, because they should be equal. Equal. I'm um, not equal to each other, but equal. So the real on the left should equal the real on the right, and the imaginary on the left should equal the imaginary on the right. And the reason for that is because the real and the imaginary, they can't interact. They are separate. So we end up with something like this equals minus 13i. Um, my i, I forgot my i. So we end up here with x equals 2. Okay, that was quite straightforward. Here we ignore the i's. And the reason we ignore the eyes is they're, they're not important. We don't want to work specifically with um, the eyes. We only care about the coefficients, the numbers in front of them. So I'm going to take away a 2 from both sides and I end up with minus 10 y equals minus 15. So y is equal to minus 15 divided by minus 10, which ends up as 3 over 2 or 1.5. Uh, they didn't give us any indication um, if x and y were real or if they were um, integers or if they were natural numbers or so on. So we can assume that that fraction is absolutely fine. Let's try another more complex one. So we want to find z. 
Now here they've told us z we want it in the form x plus yi, which means it's a complex number. So it's like solving for an x, but our answer won't simply be a value. It will be a value that has a real part and a complex or and an imaginary part. So it's going to be a complex number. Let's expand our brackets by um, splitting the first bracket and then let's figure out what's going on. So we have 2z minus zi plus 2 minus i equals 3 minus 4i. So I want to get z on its own. So I'm going to keep the 2z minus zi here and I'm going to take away a 2 from both sides and add an i to both sides. So what that ends up being is 1 uh, minus 3i. Now, this is slightly tricky and I suppose it brings us back to a little bit of manipulation of formulae from our algebra section. I have a z in two terms and I want to combine it so it's a single z. How I do that is highest common factor. So I pull it out and I end up with something like this. Now to finish off, I'm going to divide by what's beside, usually in front of the z, but it beside it either way. And I end up with 1 minus 3i minus sorry, divided by 2 minus i. Now that's fine, but it's definitely not in the form they want. So we need to work with that fraction. We need to look at using the conjugate of the denominator. So now we can see how this, you know, denominator, or using the conjugate uh, to simplify a fraction, how that can kind of appear in a question where it's maybe not the full focus of the question. So I multiply above and below by the conjugate of the denominator. The reason I do that is to try and get rid of the i on the denominator. So when we deal with that in um, thirds, we call that rationalizing. So to make it rational, it's still the same idea here. So remember, um, I suppose we really want to make it real more than so than even rational. So multiplying out, let's um, we can do that to the side or we can do it in the fraction. Usually I do it um, outside the fraction and bring it back. But I'm going to keep my space is limited. So I'm going to keep it together. The denominator here now, because we have what's effectively difference of two squares, you can do this quite simply by squaring the first minus square the last. The squaring of the second will create that I squared and we need to sub in minus one. So the denominator there will end up as five. So let's clean up the top a bit. Plus I minus six I minus three I squared all over four plus one is five. And we're nearly there. So um, again, we need to change that sign of this minus three. I squared, it becomes plus three. So uh, two plus three is five. And I minus six I is minus five I all over five. And then that simplifies down to one minus I as my final answer. So X plus YI, one minus I. So a lot going on in that. It's not like in algebra where we just find our X and that's fine. When we find it, we need to make sure this Z is in the correct form. We may have to work with the conjugate and we may need to clean it up. OK, so example 17. This is a very interesting question. And I think I like the way that it's um, the way it's been asked. And I suppose the pitfalls that students can fall into. It's quite a straightforward question, but I suppose maybe if it was worded or if it was shown slightly differently, it might be a bit easier. So it says express the square root of 5 plus 12i in the form a plus bi. So the easiest thing to do if you're ever asked to take something and write it in a specific form is really to create an equation. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right, I know that this 5 plus 12i can be written in a form a plus bi. If I can figure out what is a and what is b, I will be able to figure out what is a plus bi. Why I've created that equation here, in other ways, maybe in other questions, you might be able to work around it. But here we have a square root and there's very little we can do with the square root. And we want to get rid of the square root. But the only way I can get rid of the square root is if I'm working with an equation. When I work with an expression, I can't change it. So the key to this question really is creating that equation. 
So I'm going to square both sides, which I can do because I have an equation. And I end up with 5 plus 12i on the left equals, now square this out properly. Square the first plus twice the first by the second plus square the last. So b squared i squared. Now what we want to work with is that i squared. Let's break it down. We know that i squared can be replaced by minus 1. So we get 2abi plus b squared times minus 1. And we get 5 plus 12i equals this is really a squared minus b squared. They're the real parts plus 2abi. Now, how do we solve one equation with two unknowns? Well, can we break it up? And we can. We can look at the real parts and we can look at the imaginary parts. Um, so the real parts on the left, well, there's only one, it's five, should equal the real parts on the right. So that's a squared minus b squared. And the imaginary parts on the left, so 12i, should equal the um, imaginary parts on the right, so 12abi. We're going to ignore the i and we're actually going to simplify it down by dividing across by 2. So you get a times b is 6. Now, how do we work with that? Well, I'm going to label my equations because I think it's always easier to track when we label. I'm going to take equation 2 and I'm going to write one uh, letter in terms of the other. So I'm going to write a is equal to 6 divided by b. Now I can take that equation and or I can take that a in terms of b and sub it into equation 1. So that gives me 5 equals 6 over b squared minus b squared. Uh, that is 5 equals 36 over b squared. Remember squaring a fraction, you square the top and you square the bottom. Uh, to get rid of that b squared on the bottom, let's multiply everything by a b squared. And that gives us 5b squared equals 36 minus b to the power of 4. I'm going to bring everything over to the left. So plus b to the power of 4 plus 5b squared minus 36 equals 0. Um, you may find this easier to work with um, if you use a little bit of substitution. We can use a letter that's not already there. So maybe an x. So if we let x equal b squared, what we're going to end up with, this is really b squared squared plus 5b squared minus 36 equals 0. We end up with x squared plus 5x minus 36. We actually have a quadratic. So I suppose um, you can work with it with the b's and b's to the power of 4 if you're comfortable with that. But if you're not, you need to bring it back to something more familiar. So we can use substitution to do that. So minus 36, so we need some factors of that. So nine and four, it's gonna be plus nine minus four. Shortcut for this because the coefficient is just an x. So plus nine, x minus four equals zero. So x equals minus nine, x equals four. Let's bring it back to what we originally had. And that was actually, well, b squared equals minus nine and b squared equals four. Now, here's key. A and B are real numbers because they're the coefficients. So this B squared equals minus nine won't have any answers. So we have B equals plus or minus two. Don't forget your plus and minus. So, so important. So now let's go back to equation two. And equation two, we had that A was equal to uh, six divided by B. So um, where B is equal to two, a is equal to 6 divided by 2, which equals 3. When b is equal to minus 2, um, a is equal to 6 divided by minus 2, which is minus 3. So that can be written as either a plus bi. So here we have 3 plus 2i. Or it can be written as minus Oh, minus three. Yeah, sorry, minus two i. So there are two ways that we could write them. Example 18, the modulus of a complex number. Given that z1 is equal to four plus i and z2 is minus two plus two i, plot the following on the argon diagram. 
zero. Okay, so my zero is going to be right here. Z1, so four plus I, so there's my Z1. Z2 is minus two plus two I, so there is Z2. And then Z1 plus Z2. Okay, so let's get Z1 plus Z2. Let's add them together. Four plus I plus uh, minus two plus two I. That gives me two plus three I. So when I go plot that two plus three I, there is my Z1 plus Z2. Okay, so we really again need to connect all of those complex numbers back to the origin with preferably a straight line. Um, and what they've asked us to do is to do some calculations. So they've used these bars. Now we've met these bars before in a few places. We would have met them in coordinate geometry where they mean length. We would have met them in geometry where they mean length. We would have met them in algebra and functions where they can mean the absolute value or modulus. So we're looking at the same idea as the modulus. Um, in algebra. But when we talk about the modulus of a complex number, we're really looking at the distance to zero. And we discuss that when we talk about absolute value and the modulus in terms of algebra. But for us, that zero, that is coming back maybe at an angle, which basically turns modulus into the distance between that complex number point and the origin. So the length of that line that we've been drawing in. So how we do that, there's a little formula. You need to know this formula off by heart. There is a little formula that might help. It's not the right formula, but if you're really struggling, um, you can use on page 17 the vector formula, just as an absolute last resort. Do try to learn this off by heart. So the absolute value, or sorry, the modulus of Z is given as the square root of A squared plus B squared. And where that's coming from, it's actually Pythagoras. So if I take Z1 for a second, I have, now if I had drawn that line a little bit nicer, I have a right angle triangle. I have a right angle triangle that has four here and one here. So to work out the hypotenuse, it is the sum of the square of the other two sides. So four squared plus one squared, all under the square root. And that is how we get that modulus. So let's do some calculations. So let's do some calculations. The modulus of Z1 is going to be the square root of 4 squared plus 1 squared. So I'm taking that from the coefficient. So 4 is the real part and the 1 is coming from the coefficient of I. So that's the square root of 16 plus 1, the square root of 17. The modulus of Z2 then is the square root of, I'm looking here, at minus 2 squared plus 2 squared. 4 and 4, that's root 8, or 2 root 2. And then the modulus of Z1 plus Z2 combined. So we'll add them first, which we've actually done here. I'm going to use this. And that's the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared, which is square root of 4 plus 9, which is square root of 13. So you might expect that... Uh, of the modulus of Z1 plus the modulus of Z2 would equal the modulus of Z1 plus Z2. But when we do that, root 17 plus 2 root 2, do we get root 13? And the answer is very much no. No, we do not. And actually what we find is that actually the combined Z1 plus Z2 is actually smaller in length the modulus is smaller than the two combined. Example 19, the conjugate root theorem. So the conjugate root theorem is a very important theorem to help us to find roots or to solve these quadratic equations that have complex roots very, very quickly. So basically what the conjugate root theorem states is that if we have a complex root, the conjugate is also a root as long as the coefficients of that equation are real. So here we can see 
that we have z, which is 2 plus i, and we have z bar, we want to show that that is also a root. So what we should be able to do is when we sub in um, a root, it should equal 0. So if we have z bar, sorry, z is a root, which they told us it is, we want to show that z bar, the conjugate, so the conjugate is 2 minus i. We want to show that that's a root. How we show that's the root, it's the same method as when we we're in algebra and functions, and that is substitution. So everywhere there is um, a z, we're subbing in the root, and we should be able to show that that equals zero. If we do, then it will be a root. But because we know the conjugate root theorem, we know that if z is a root, then the conjugate z bar will also be a root. So square the first, twice the first by the second, square the last, minus 8 plus 4i plus 5 equals 0. Um, I'm going to tidy up what I can. So 4 subtract 8, so that's minus 4 plus 5, so I get 1 plus i squared equals 0. i squared can be replaced with minus 1, so we get 0 equals 0, which is true. Therefore, z bar is also a root. Now, will we ever be asked to do this? Probably not. More likely that you'll be asked um, something got to do with understanding or remembering that conjugate root theorem. So here's another example of where we can use the conjugate root theorem. Um, here they've given us one root, which is z, but they've given us a cubic rather than a quadratic. And the same rules apply because that particular equation has real coefficients. And what I mean by that is the numbers in front of the z's, they're real numbers, not imaginary or complex numbers. That means that z bar is also the root. They want us to show that z bar is the root. So let's take our z, 1 plus 2i. Let's find our z bar, our conjugate, which is 1 minus 2i. And let's substitute in. So I get 1 minus 2i cubed minus z squared, which is 1 minus 2i squared plus 3 times z, so 3 times 1 minus 2i plus 5 equals 0. I'm going to multiply one of these brackets by the square, which is square the first, twice the first by the second, square the last, minus, and this is squared, so 1 minus 4i plus 4i squared plus 3 minus 6i plus 5 equals 0. Do tidy up before you do any other multiplication. So for example, this um, plus 4i squared, i squared can be substituted or changed for minus 1. So we end up with minus 3 minus 4i here, which is a little bit easier to work with. Same for this bracket. Um, and then we can tidy up what we can. So I have a plus 8 minus 6i equals 0. Um, expanding this, I'm going to split my bracket. So 1 times minus 3 minus 4i, minus 2i times minus 3 minus 4i. I end up with plus 3 plus 4i plus 8 minus 6i equals 0. I get minus 3 minus 4i plus 6i plus 8i squared. I can tidy up a little bit more. So 3 and 8 is 11 and minus 2i equals 0. Again, watch that i squared. We're going to sub in instead of i squared minus 1. So we end up with um, 11. Take away that 3. So that's our 8. So that's the 3 and the plus 11 used. Um, I shouldn't actually cross them because they look like they're cancelling each other out, they're not. And um, the plus 8i squared gives us minus 8. I then end up with minus 4 plus 6. That's plus 2i, minus 2i, that is 0. This is 0 equals 0. Therefore, z bar is also a root. Okay, so we're just using substitution, but there's a lot of algebra there. There's a lot of expanding, simplifying, and so on. We then have a second part to the question, which says, hence, find the third root. So 
hence find the third root. So I'm going to show you two different methods to start this. Um, but I suppose they both will boil down to long division. Because what we want to do is we're going to take our roots, basically find the factor of those two combined individual factors, divide that in to find then that third factor. So there's two different ways to approach it to get the quadratic piece. So I think I have two roots, which in turn make two factors, which in turn make a quadratic. So I'm going to show you two different methods to do that. So method one is your roots to factors. So I have two two roots. I have root 1 is 1 plus 2i and I have a second root which is 1 minus 2i. So one is the conjugate of the other. So if I was to change those two roots, really what we want to do is we want to allow it equal to 0. So we want to let them equal to 0. That in turn gives us our factors. So we start with the roots and we end up with a factor of z minus 1 minus 2i equals 0. And um, it may feel a little bit different than obviously when we work in algebra because in algebra there's just a number we're just dealing with the real part now we have a complex number so there's the real part and the imaginary piece when I have two factors then I can let my two factors um, multiply them together and let the product equal zero so when I multiply them together it should give me zero and when I multiply that out I'm going to get a quadratic so I'm going to split my bracket and um, I know some people don't split their brackets but I would say just be very careful with your multiplication here there's a lot going on and a lot to remember so splitting the bracket although it may seem long and tedious some of the time this is definitely one area where it can help um, stop silly mistakes really so I have z squared minus z plus 2iz minus z plus 1 minus 2i minus 2iz plus 2i minus 4i squared equals 0. So I have a plus 2iz minus 2iz so that's 0 minus 2i plus 2i again that's 0. I have an i squared that I need to be careful and work with that's going to go to a plus 4 so I end up oh sorry and I'll actually at the same time I'll add my like terms so I end up with z squared minus 2z plus 1 plus 4 so plus 5 equals 0. So that's my quadratic and I know that actually that quadratic is a root of the cubic. Now, I'm going to do long division, but before I do my long division piece, let me show you a second method that we could come up with that particular quadratic. So this method's a little bit quicker. Um, it's a shortcut formula. So you may have met this formula in algebra. It's one that I would look at very briefly um, to show how to bring the roots of a quadratic to the quadratic equation very quickly. And there is a downfall in the sense that you have to learn off this formula. So it's not ideal for algebra. Plus in algebra, we tend to be looking at cubics and bigger equations. Um, I suppose our multiplication is a little bit easier. But in complex numbers, this shortcut is invaluable. It's definitely a formula to learn off and it can really, really help. So the formula is z squared minus sum of the roots, uh, z plus product of the roots. So what I'm going to do is the sum of roots. Um, so I'm basically adding z plus z bar, so z and its conjugate. So that gives me 1 plus 2i plus 1 minus 2i and that gives me 2. Then I multiply the product of the roots. Now, depending on how okay you are with this, you can do this very quickly because we have what is like a difference of two squares. Um, so you end up with square the first minus square the last, so 4i squared, which then you can change the minus 4i squared to plus 4 and we get 5. Into my formula, I get z squared minus 2 times z plus 5. It's going to be equal 0 because it's going to be an equation. And there, very quickly, we have the same answer. So I suppose um, the multiplication, it is long enough. 
Um, if you have to do it that way, not a big deal. However, look at the errors that could happen when you're doing such big multiplication. This shortcut to get to that quadratic, hugely beneficial. So now that we've got to the quadratic, whichever method we want, let's do the long division to find that third factor and in turn the third root. Okay, so I've just set up my long division here. You could do a missing factor here, but to be honest, this method is much easier. A bit of long division. It's very straightforward. No big issues. If you want to do a little rough work in the corner, you can. Remember with our division, we have divide, multiply, subtract, bring it down and start again. When we divide, we always divide the first term by the first term. So we have z cubed divided by z squared, which just gives us a z. You can place them over towards the right. I like to start at the start here. So z cubed minus 2z squared. Squared, so the multiplication, you're multiplying all three terms. So z by z squared, z cubed, z by minus 2z, minus 2z squared, plus 5 times z. So divide, multiply, subtract really means change our signs. So we end up cancelling or this going to zero, our z cubed minus z cubed, they're going to zero. And then we end up with z squared at minus 2z, bring it down, so the plus 5, and let's start again. You'll notice that the division, it's just going to give me plus 1, so I get z squared minus 2z plus 5. Uh, subtract, we end up changing all of our signs. It will give us a remainder of 0, which gives us z plus 1 as our final factor. So that means our root is z equals 1 minus one sorry so that is our final root that's not surprising our third root would have to be a real number given that the coefficients here are real if the coefficients here were not real we'd be dealing with a very different type of question so example 21, here's some more of the conjugate root theorem. So it's important to remember that when we have a complex root, the conjugate is also a root when the coefficients are real. So they've told us here that 1 plus 5i, which is z, is a root of this equation, az squared plus bz plus c equals 0. And it says find the values of a, b, c. Now there's two different ways you can approach this question. You can do substitution. Um, I find that's a little bit long. Um, if you sub in z, you have to sub in z bar, it's conjugate, um, to get simultaneous equations, it gets very messy. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, the roots are z, 1 plus 5i, and also it's conjugate. How I know that is the conjugate root theorem. They told me that a, b, and c are elements of real. Therefore, I can get the factors, which is z minus 1 minus 5i equals 0, and the second one, z minus 1 plus 5i equals zero. So just to label it, these are my roots here. Here are my factors. Once I get my factors, I can multiply. So I know it looks different than algebra. I know it may not feel as familiar um, as when we're working with our x's, but actually the method is pretty much the same. So stick with it. Make sure you have a very clear understanding of how to work between your roots and your factors, and you'll be fine. So just be very, very careful and mindful when you're doing this um, multiplication. Like I said, I think writing it out, splitting that bracket will make a lot more sense and it will lead you to make less silly errors. Um, when you're writing our i's and our z's, z is like the variable. It is the thing that will come last. So it's like our x. So I will come before Z. Think of your alphabetical order to help. Uh, it's not a big deal if you don't write in the right order. Um, you're not going to lose any marks. Um, I say that depends on where, where you're being asked to do this. So I, I suppose it's not something to get worried about. So minus 25I squared equals zero. We need to do um, a little bit of cleanup. So a minus 5i plus 5i minus 5iz plus 5iz. And um, we then have our minus z minus z 
and our plus one minus 25i squared. So z squared minus z minus z is minus 2z. We then have plus one and then plus 25 when we put in our minus one there instead of i squared. And that equals zero. So there we are working with our roots to factors. We could have also used our shortcut formula there. Um, and again, it's completely up to you if you want to work that way. To do that, we want to look at the sum of the roots. So the sum is going to be uh, z plus z bar. So our root plus the conjugate of the root, which is 1 plus 5i plus 1 minus 5i, which just gives us 2. And then the product. Every time we add and multiply our root by its conjugate, so any complex number by its conjugate, we do expect to get a real answer. So 1 plus 5i times 1 minus 5i. Again, this can be done very quickly with a difference of 2 squared, 2 squares, sorry. So we end up with 1 minus 25, so we get plus 26. Um, so we end up with z squared minus 2z plus the product root plus 26 equals 0. So now let's look at an exam style question. Now there's three parts to this and they've been taken from different exam questions. So this wasn't one full exam question, but it just gives you an, an idea of how these um, equation style questions are asked. So they tell us that minus four plus three i is one root of this equation. It has z's, so we know it's complex numbers. They tell us the ABC, the um, coefficients and the constant are elements of or, which means they're real. They tell us i squared is equal to minus one and they want us to write the other root. So this is the conjugate root theorem. So if I know that z is a root, z bar is also a root as long as, and that's the important piece, the coefficients of the equation are real. And that's key. And because they've told us there that a, b, and c are elements of four, we know that that second root is um, the conjugate. So if you want to make it clear, there is my other root. And notice they did say just write down. They didn't want anything else. It was just write it down. Okay, so the next part, verify that 2i is the root of the equation and hence find the other root of the equation. So there's two parts to this question. So one, verify that 2i is the root of the equation and two, hence find the other root. So the first thing we're going to do is verify that it's a root. In order to verify that it's a root, we're going to sub in. So z squared minus 1 plus 3i times z plus minus 2 plus 2i equals 0. So if I know that the root is 2i, so z equals 2i, that is the root, every time I sub in 2i instead of z, it should work in the equation. And really what I mean by that is that the equation should balance. It should be equal to 0. So let's work this through. So we get 4i squared minus, uh, now you can do these in two parts. I'm going to do minus times 2i and then multiply it. So I get 6i squared there minus 2 plus 2i equals 0. Um, we end up with minus 2i plus 2i go to 0. I end up with 4 times minus 1 minus 6 times minus 1 minus 2 equals 0, which gives me minus 4 plus 6 minus 2 equals 0, which is 0 equals 0. Therefore, 2i is a root of the equation. Okay, so we're able to show that it's a root the same way as we would in algebra. Now, here we have an interesting part two, hence find the other root of the equation. The reason it's interesting is because the conjugate root theorem does not work here. And the reason it does not work here is because the coefficients in that equation are not real numbers. So you can see that the coefficient of z is minus 1 plus 3i, so that's a complex number, and the constant is minus 2 plus 2i, again, a complex number. So we cannot use that, the fact that the conjugate is the same 
second root because that is not true. So here I'm going to show you one method um, and I'm only going to do one method and I'll show you the other two methods for the next part because they're quite similar. So the method I'm going to focus on now for this one is the shortcut. Now you could work this in other ways but I just want you to see firstly how easy this little formula is to use in a different way. So we have used it already um, by looking at saying let's make the equation. Here we have a different type of question. Here I have the quadratic equation and I want to use that to find the second root because I cannot use the conjugate root theorem. So what I'm going to say is firstly I have the first root which is z and that is equal to 2i and I'm going to have a second root so I'm going to call the second root a plus bi. Now it doesn't matter you can call it m plus ni, whatever it looks like, but it has to be a complex number. Um, the reason why you know it's going to be complex is because this whole equation will be a complex equation because it has complex coefficients. So I'm going to use the fact um, this, in this shortcut for the idea of the sum. So the sum is going to be 2i plus a plus bi and the product is going to be 2i times a plus bi. I'm going to multiply that out. I get 2ai plus 2bi squared. That turns into minus 1. So I get minus 2b plus 2ai. That's the product. From my equation, I can see that the sum of the roots is 1 plus 3i. So I know that this, um, sorry now, I'll find my pen. So this equals 1 plus 3i. And if we go back and I'll get color that hopefully shows up, the product of the roots here is this product of the roots. So I know that the product of the roots should equal minus 2 plus 2i. And I should be able to, in either one, figure out what the letters mean. So let's take the first one here, the sum. I have a plus 2i plus bi equals 1 plus 3i. So if I equate the real numbers, so the real numbers on the left with the real numbers on the right, I get, well, a must equal 1. So there's my answer for a. Second thing I need is b. So let's take a look at the imaginary on the left and the imaginary on the right. So that gives me 2i plus bi equals 3i. Ignore those i's for a minute. 2 plus b equals 3, so b must be 1. Now you could do the exact same thing over here for the product. So minus 2b plus 2ai should equal minus 2 plus 2i. You could argue that actually this one's a little bit easier to work with because there is less terms. And again, you can pull out very quickly from the imaginary parts that a equals 1. And from the real parts, we'd pull out the B equals 1. You don't need to because we're getting the same answers. But what that does is it helps us get the other root. The other root here can be written as 1 plus 1i or simply 1 plus i. So that is my other root. So knowing that shortcut, very, very helpful. There are two other ways that you could approach this. We could use this idea of a missing factor or we could use long division. I'm not going to do it for this part, but I'll show you both um, methods in the next part. So part C is a very similar question. Again, we can't use the conjugate root theorem, um, but this time the root is not just an imaginary root. It is a complex root. Um, so here we're looking at, I have one root. I have the equation. The second root is definitely not the conjugate because the coefficients are not real. Um, and it's clearly telling me um, to find the other root in the form m plus ni. So I'm going to, obviously the easiest way would be to use the formula in my opinion, but I want to show you other ways that if you wanted to approach it, you could. So the first way I'm going to do is long division. So I know that z is equal to 1 plus i. Remember that this is a root. When we think of long division, we work with our factors. So we bring this back to a factor. Um, so that is equal to zero, but that's my factor. Ignore the equal zero. And that's what I'm going to divide in. So I'm going to do z minus one minus i into 
z squared plus minus 2 plus i z plus 3 minus i definitely suggest a little rough for a column over here and um, divide multiply subtract bring it down start again okay so some people love long division and that's why i want to show this could you use long division yeah of course so divide remember you're always dividing the first term by the first term and that is it so z squared divided by z is z now the multiplication you work on every part so you have z plus now you can work this in a few different ways but really we have z by minus one minus i and if you look at the second term it looks like that but backwards so minus one minus i z so minus one minus i z so that can be combined into a single term or you could have expanded the start just try and make them look the same really sorry i lost my squared there then you subtract now if you want to subtract you want to subtract everything so this becomes a plus and this also becomes a plus so you get minus two plus one which is minus one and plus that should be an i and then a sorry plus i and i have an i underneath plus i so that's plus two i and then you have the z now if you're going oh i'd exp i'd prefer if that was expanded out that's fine but i suppose this format helps with the division because now when i come along to do my division piece my division just gives me the coefficient which is plus minus one plus two i so that gives me that piece there i multiply it out i end up with minus one plus two i z and i bring down sorry i should have done that first three minus i and then i am multiplying minus one minus i by minus one plus two i bring that out or split out that bracket rather plus two i minus i this is why i think if you are going to approach it that i'm um, a little rough for column hugely beneficial if you're kind of looking at this going i would never approach it like that that's fine try it see if you can get the exact same answer um working with the formula if that's the way you'd prefer to work it two i squared so we end up with plus two so i get a three minus i which is what we expect and then we change our signs so this becomes minus and i cancel minus here plus here dunk dunk again you could write that as one it gives me z plus one minus sorry minus one plus two i you can drop that bracket if you want um so sorry it's z minus one plus two i that is the other factor I want to break it down into the root so I let that equal zero and I effectively solve so z equals one minus two i and that is the second root okay so this is the other root now like I said I think using the little formula we have for quadratics and that shortcut formula is definitely the easiest but it is possible to use long division and i know some people love long division and um, it's definitely more error prone because there's more to it and it is a little bit more complex because we're dealing with complex numbers so bear that in mind so the last method i want to show for this the same style of question so for b or c i'm going to work it in c is working with this idea of a missing root so um really what i'm talking about is missing root but missing factor so if i have my first root as one plus i i can let my second root be and they've given it to us m plus n i they're my roots actually i'm going to write them side by side to make it a little bit easier and what i mean by that is to label because these are my roots and i want to bring it down to my factors so again, I'm going to bring everything over and let it equal zero. So I get Z minus one minus I equals zero. That's my first root. Z minus M minus N I. That is my second. I then can multiply those together and I'll get my quadratic. So Z minus one minus I times Z minus M minus N I equals zero. Again, if you're not into this multiplication, this is only another method. Okay, stick to the method you like. I'm just showing you all the options. Everyone is different. Even though I'm saying oh, I wouldn't do this, maybe you would. And that's okay. 
sometimes we might have a question where it's easier to do one of these other methods. So it's good to have at least seen them. Minus mz minus nIz. Don't worry too much about your letters as we get to this. I try, I say alphabetical order, but I think I have them slightly off alphabetical order because the i is in the end. But don't worry too much about that. So ni minus iz plus mi plus ni squared equals zero. A lot going on here. Um, so let's see if we can tidy anything up because we may not have a huge amount. So I find it really, really challenging to see when I have so much going on. So I have a Z. I'm going to just gather all my Z terms. I know I can't add them, but let's just get all those Z terms together. Um, and there's one that I missed. And then I have an I squared. So what I want to do, let me change my color. This actually becomes minus N. So I want anything that is non Z. So they're effectively my constants. I'm going to use a highlighter for this. I have an M and N I. I know it has an I and that's fine. And a minus N. So we end up with something quite complex. Um, let me write it down. So oh, we have z squared, so that's okay. Then in terms of the z, so I'm going to just put a plus and use a bracket. I have a minus m, a minus ni, a minus 1. So I've used this one, this one, this one, and then a minus i, and then I put my z out at the end. Okay, you don't have to do it like that, but it's just a little bit easier to see what's going on. Plus, and then I'm going to have m minus n, so there's my m, my minus n, plus ni plus mi equals zero. How is this in any way helpful? Well, really, we want to go back to what we originally were given. So you can write this as an identity, or you can do it like I've done it one over the other. So we basically end up with minus m, minus ni, minus 1, minus i, and that's the same as minus 2 plus i. And we can really work this in any way we want. So I'm going to keep the m and the n over here. I'm going to bring everything else across. So I'm going to add a 1 to both sides, and I'm going to add an i to both sides. And if we then change our signs, because we want m, plus ni, we get 1 minus 2i. We look like we have our answer. I'm going to show you what would happen if you worked with the second one. Hopefully, we will get the same answer. And um, This is a much longer method, but again, has its place. I suppose we could use it if we wanted to. This one's a little bit harder to work with because we have so many um, m's and n's. So what we would do is we look at the real parts um, which will be m minus n, so anything that doesn't have an i equals 3. We then look at the imaginary parts, and that would be n i plus m i equals minus i. I'm ignoring the minus, or sorry, I'm ignoring the i's, which gives me n plus m equals, be careful here, it's minus 1. And then we would work a little bit of simultaneous equations, uh, 2m equals, and I think if we worked it through, we would get the same answer, dot, dot, dot. And we would end up with m equals 1 and n equals minus 2. So therefore, our root will end up as m minus ni. Okay, so that is what we should end up with and the same answer. So that's the second method. And actually, maybe that's even worse than long division for you. But remember, the third method that I haven't shown for this part C, I showed it for part B, but that you could do, and it's probably the easiest, is that shortcut for the quadratic equation.